Okay, so um, hello, I'm Ederson de Souza. I'm a OS developer engineer at Intel. I've been working on Intel for like 10 years now, and I've been working with Zephyr for the last one and a half years. And today I'll be talking about uh, Zephyr Footprint, uh, where are we and where are we going? And what do I mean by that? So that's the agenda. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking about footprint. What is footprint and, and what the footprint I'll be talking more uh, during uh, the presentation. Uh, some tools that we have available on Zephyr uh, to deal with the footprint issue. Uh, some hints that we usually have uh, back of the mind or if you do some search uh, about uh, how to reduce the footprint. And then the, I think that most interesting part will talk about some experiments I have done that try to address uh, some issues and then have some time for questions. So what is Footprint? Uh, what I'm talking about? Well, and I'm talking about software Footprint, let's be clear. So, so it's the biggest impact uh, of the software on some resource, like the flash uh, memory, like the RAM, so like how much memory is being used by, by an application. Uh, it can be uh, the power consumption as well. All those are footprints. Uh, all of those are uh, resources that the software is consuming. And uh, we usually want to reduce the usage of resources. Uh, we usually want to do that to save money because we can use like a smaller chip, a uh, smaller memory. Uh, we can save energy, so we can uh, use a. Uh, we can save some. Uh, we can save the planet, depending on, on how you see it. Uh, so basically, resources are things that we uh, are scarce, and we want to to minimize the impact, minimize the usage of them. So that's footprint, and that's why we care about. And to be able to reduce the footprint, you need to be able to know what the footprint is to start with, right? It's, uh, it's something that you can measure, luckily, right? Because it's, it, by definition, it's how big is the impact. So you, you need to be able to measure it. And there are several tools available to measure uh, footprint, depending on the kind of footprint. You can use like it for energy. There are probably different tools, uh, and you want those tools, and you want them like integrated on your system, on your production and you know, development. You want to be able to catch regressions. Like if you do a change, you don't want to start using more memory or start to use more better than before. And, and of course, you need to measure to be able to see the improvements. Uh, for instance, one example is the ROM report tool uh, that is available on Zephyr. is one of the targets for the West build. And it's as simple to use as using West build dash T ROM report. It will then generate a report. This is an example of a, a The output, I trimmed the bit so you can see like the interesting part. It shows a hierarchical uh, report of the usage uh, of memory for your ROM. So it's like after the, the executable is done, is compiled, you can go and check like if this function is occupying those, is using all those bytes, and this other function is using all those bytes, and you can see like what are the biggest uh, uh, users of uh, memory of the, the ROM, and then you can try to do something about it. Uh, it's really nice. I'm not sure if everyone knew it, but it's, it, it's really handy. And when dealing with footprints, we usually want to try to um, minimize the usage. And there are some things that we usually will think about how we can do that. You can find on Google. Uh, you can. I don't know if you can ask ChatGPT to find this, uh, but uh, you can ask some friend. Definitely, you can ask them on Discord, and there will be some common hints that everyone will tell. For instance, if we're talking about uh, 
the ROM. Uh, it's one of the easiest ways of the saving uh, spaces, the saving in you know, the features and subsystem software. If you're not using ISPRC, there's no need to be compiling it into your uh, application. So that's, I think, is the easiest and probably the biggest uh, way of saving. Uh, you can try to avoid having holes on your structs as well. That's a, another common hint. And again, Zephyr has a nice tool here. Uh, you can mm, use a hole to check for holes on your structs. And what do I mean by holes on your structs? Is you have your struct and say it has all its members. Each one uh, will be occupying some space in memory, but for performance reasons, the compiler will usually align uh, those with the processor uh, cache line. So you can actually be reading everything as fast as it's possible. And uh, the problem is that we then add some padding and it's possible to minimize this padding. Uh, so you can actually don't use uh, so much, too much memory. And again, there are tools that help you try to figure out when the, you are having those problems. And Zephyr has integrated like a whole on, on the target of West build. So you can, again, just use it to get a nice report on, on the health of, the, of your structs if you are wasting uh, space there. You could try different tool chains, for instance. So usually when uh, tool chain, uh, the next version, uh, you have like better compilation techniques. And it, it, you can see that uh, you can shape some bytes from your uh, application for just uh, change the chain, if it's possible, of course. Uh, for other kinds of uh, uh, footprint, like in the RAM, you could try to limit the number of threads. So each thread will have its own stack. So you can save some RAM if you have less threads. But then there's a compromise on your application, how you can design it. It's always a compromise. For instance, power management. If what you care about, if what you're caring about is like the energy consumption, if you can enable power management for the, the board and the, the devices you are using, that's perfect. Uh, but that will also add code to your application. So then you have the trade-off with the size of the application. Even mentioned the logging, again, is a, more on the size of the application side. You can uh, reduce the amount of logging that you lose effort. So um, macro basis, so you can, things will be uh, reduced in compile time. So you'll save uh, the, the size of the application. And uh, for the experiments, uh, there's one thing that I'm just noticing here. Uh, it seems that it, okay, no, uh, uh, and that that's where we are. But that's some tools that we have. That the hints that we can find right now. Uh, but what else? Is, is there anything more exciting coming? Can we say? We just use it some other ways. So what else is available? And being curious about that, I decided to make some experiments. Uh, I was talking to people. I got some ideas. I tried to get like what what's going on, and decided to see what is worth trying to to pursue and trying to reduce footprint. And let's set some expectations about experiments. You probably noticed that I'm talking a lot about the size of the application. I tried to hook other uh, kind of footprint, but I'm most worried about the application size. Uh, so that's basically the focus of my, uh, my experiments. On those experiments, I was experimenting what I could do, what we can do, but not if, uh, and the results will guide, oh, this is nice, so we probably want that. Uh, and the way I tested, some people will look, no, no, you shouldn't have been done this way. And please let me know uh, about uh, other ways of trying to achieve what, what I did on my experiment. But I'm not prescribing how. I just try to have something, some kind of baseline that I could use to test, to get some results, to get some numbers, and see if we can go further on these or not. 
Uh, as I started going down the rabbit hole here, uh, I'm kind of deviated a bit from trying to run something because my focus is on the application size. So maybe uh, things maybe can be broken by the, the, the experiment. I don't expect anything to be fundamentally broken. I kind of expect only minor breakage, hopefully. So if we want to go in some direction, I think that's possible and the issues are solvable. Uh, but yeah, if you just try to replicate the experiment and say, oh, but it's all nice and beautiful, but doesn't work, uh, it may happen. Uh, that That's true. And I use some open source projects on the test because uh, just trying to do that with really uh, gimmicky applications uh, is not interesting. It's, it's kind of boring. We can see the idea, but if we can, if you want to have real results, no word data, we need to use uh, some real word applications. But I'm not going to find anything about those applications. I'm not uh, trying to imply that I will uh, try to submit patches to, to those applications or that. Or that they are using too much. They are, they are big applications, nothing like that. I just want some real world applications. And that's one of the wonders of open source. There are real world applications out there that you can try and experiment with. So, one of the ideas uh, was about uh, uh, eliminating some function points. And the, the kind of, I'm joking. I mentioned that they are considered harmful, but I'm not care about the the reason that usually uh, function points are, are harmful is the indirect call. But that's not about it. It's just that uh, one thing uh, that we end up having with uh, function pointers is that like the compiler cannot see through it and they cannot uh, eliminate some code based on that could not be used because it can't see through the the function pointer. And Zephyr uses lots of function pointers. Like the APIs are basically uh, based on them. So here's an example uh, for the K scan uh, API. You, we, you have like a struct uh, that has like some function pointers inside it. And then the driver, uh, when the driver initializes, it will define the, the function pointers. Uh, that would do the, the actions uh, required by the API. And the API itself will basically uh, be calling those function pointers internally uh, based on the uh, device struct that you're uh, using. You'll get the API associated with that and you then do the calls. So the idea here is could we? do that differently, something like uh, C++ templates. So we would know at the compile time what is being actually used, and the compiler will have like more proper printers to avoid compiling uh, some functions and try to save some, some bytes there. Something like case scan and the, the driver actually being used. Well, maybe. Uh, in the C word, I think on C11, we have like the generic uh, keyword, and you could use that to have like a switch uh, doing a dispatcher based on the type. But there's a problem here uh, that uh, you, you won't normally know that at compile time, but while you're writing your code. And that kind of defeats one of the interesting things that we have in Zephyr that's the device tree. So you can do like just change the device you are using uh, while compiling in one point and not having to change code everywhere. So maybe the device tree can help me with that. That's interesting, uh, but that starts becoming complicated. And I was, OK, uh, I won't go exactly this line, trying to map DTS to some generic thing. But because it kind of sounds really complicated, <laughs> at least to, to start with. But the idea is not lost. Actually, we could do something uh, in, like that, trying to have like a, some static dispatching. So I think that uh, instead, 
basically the idea here instead of trying to use GTS to get the some code generators that could help with the the static dispatching thing, uh, we could have some code being generated from like the key configs that are enabled. Uh, and for that, then I generate some code. And with some rejects, I can try to change some drive. So what did I do actually? Uh, I basically create a script that uh, uh, goes on all the drivers. Actually, I have like a metadata that says the drivers that I kind of enabled doing that. It goes into those uh, the directories. It basically grabs for the instantiation, like the, the um, where you do the API with the function pointers. And I try to get those function pointers and create like direct calls to them. So instead of uh, being going through the function pointer, I'll have a simply a direct call to, to that function that uh, I can then you call from the API if that is defined. So it's ugly, but I think it, it works for testing. Uh, and then the dispatcher is basically this code that's basically included. Uh, so I had to go into the drivers and add this include. So uh, the, gener the generated code will be inside there. I can hook that into the build. Uh, and I can have this code that calls uh, without the function pointer. And my hope here is like the compiler will be able in later stages uh, to avoid adding code that's not actually being used. So with that, uh, I'm not showing the script here because it's just like kind of big Python script that does some rejects and generates some code. With that code uh, uh, generated, I was able to test. Uh, but as soon as I started doing that, there were some issues. The very first one, it is like you notice that I had like a uh, def uh, that like an EPCX driver is using the static thing called this. What if I have more than one driver for the same subsystem? So if I have two GPIO drivers, two K scan drivers being used, then all bets are off actually. Uh, I would need to have a way on runtime to differentiate to which one's being called again. And I would have to have like a switch doing the dispatching. And that actually adds code. And in the very first tests, it added more code than was being saved. So, OK, this is only useful if we have just one uh, driver for a given subsystem kind of driver. So only one nice first driver, only one kickstand driver. So I kind of changed the script. to only try to do nothing if that was the case. How do I know what's enabled? I basically go into the directory, try to figure out if rejects from the CMake lists, which is the if def that's been used for that uh, driver, and check if that if that, is, if that configuration is actually defined on the kconfig, on the dot .config file that's generated inside the build directory. So it's, it's catchy, but uh, it's work. So using only, and then when I run on, the, on some real world uh, projects, I know so that for most, it's kind of expected to have just one. Sometimes I have two, but uh, it doesn't seem to be like too far fetched to expect just one uh, driver being enabled at some point. Uh, so with that information, I said, okay, let's, Let's try to expand this. So I start doing that for a few drivers. I list them there. There's the C, there's the SPRC, Keyscan. Uh, and I went to some real, to like trying to collect some data, I went to some real uh, open source projects. And I chose those three, the Swatch, uh, the Intel EC firmware, and ZMK. And 
as my goal as just to see the, if there is a reduction on the size of the application, I just try to use the board that described first on the, the pro, each project readme and uh, and see how it goes. When I was doing the first tests with the, the uh, this, I was actually using the current version of Zephyr at the time. It was like a month ago. And uh, those projects are actually on top of some older version of Zephyr. So I could have, of course, changed my uh, my work to be on top of the same ver version they were using. But of course, I'm not all that smart. And I did one each time. <laughs> and each time I ended up rebasing them on top of the latest Zephyr. And here, things may be already wrong. This process may not be, uh, there may be subtle bugs just because of the rebase. But uh, I still went ahead. I want to get the numbers. And uh, as I said, I don't think any problem here would be fundamental. So we can, if I can run and if I can find some bugs running, I can try to to fix them. I don't, I don't think. I'm hopeful that it won't be really, really bad. And that is after SDK I used uh, with 16. One. And the numbers. Okay. So when I try to use that for uh, this watch. I was able to save like 850 bytes, which is a whopping 0.1% of the project size. So yeah, quite underwhelming, but it's like something 0.1% uh, for the Intel C firmware. Uh, the results were a bit better. Uh, it was like 1,400 bytes, which is it amounts to like 1.5% of the size of price. So it's kind of a more valid uh, again something that's more interesting so i thought okay the next application i'm going to test is the mk that's smaller if you compile that uh, of course it went wrong uh, i still don't know why but the mk actually got bigger and when i looked at the wrong reports i basically this data is coming from wrong reports so after i compiled uh, i got the wrong report i compiled again with the static patching code trickery and run the wrong report again. Uh, and for ZMK, it got bigger. And it seems that some dead code was kind of zombified back to life. I really don't know what's going on with uh, ZMK. But I kind of got curious, OK, I don't know why this code is being brought back. But uh, you know. Removing that code is actually something that LTO is more famous, right? Or it, it's basically the, which made that code elimination. You compile, uh, the compiler adds some metadata to the compiled codes that then the linker during the linking phase will be able to inspect this metadata and be more confident on eliminating uh, some code that wasn't used. It's a no dream of Zephyr. Actually, it's, uh, I think Zephyr is now on the issues like more than 50,000, and there's an issue with the number in the 2000s about uh, LTO. It's kind of old. Uh, there are reports of people using it downstream, so it's kind of confident. That, that's kind of nice. Uh, what I did, I basically added those flags, the LFTO and FTO objects. Uh, it's quite easy actually to do some tests. That's nice. And you just add that to the last build. And of course, things won't build. You will figure out that there are some uh, code that's missing. Too much code is missing at the end, like a main set. Your compiler can is free to use like the main set function to set some bytes in memory. And it's not there unless you mark as used. Use the compiler to, to mark them as used. So, uh, but that's not bad actually. Uh, just a small series of pets. I could send them a string if, it, uh, if there's interest. But it's just adding some some of those, and I was able to compile everything. So those are the results. So I, here I basically compiled the results for using the, the static dispatch idea, just LTO. 
factors uh, and L2 plus the settings package because that was I thought would save the ZMK case. For this watch, it tripled the gains. So now instead of 0.3, 0 0.1% of savings, now it's 0.3% of savings, uh, which is still basically nothing. Uh, with both the, the static dispatch idea, I'm calling it static dispatch, but maybe it's not the right name for it. Uh, it's just to avoid the function point. Uh, maybe direct dispatch. And uh, it gets to 0.4% for this watch. For the EC, the Intel EC firmware, uh, the gains were kind of expressive actually. We felt it was just out to save like 11%. Uh, with plus the status patch 13.7, and that, that, that's really encouraging. So, oh, that, that's really cool. I just need to run it. Uh, ZMK kept surprising. Uh, the gains with LTO were also huge, 13%, but LTO plus the status patch from before, but actually, I still lost to 1.9% on that case. So I'm still puzzled. Uh, I don't know what's going on. If someone has an idea, uh, please ping me. And well, that's basically it. Uh, those were the, the, the few tests that I had done. I also tested with like different two chains, but it isn't included here because it was like a boring. But it kind of notes that you can save some bytes, yes, if you go with, uh, if you use newer two chains. Like it basically try to use different versions of the, the first K or some other uh, two chain arm, I think. Uh, so, what are, what are the results here? Oh, clearly LTO is interesting. Like there's interest on LTO. Uh, I think that uh, on the containers uh, presentation yesterday ish, uh, there was again some uh, call about the LTO. So, Definitely something that we should be looking at. Uh, and what about the status patch idea? Is useful? I think it is, but I'm not sure if the way I have done is is the way to go. It's, it feels too sketchy, but it can save some one two percent on some projects, not ZMK for some reason. Uh, and I still think that the first idea of like trying to use the device tree to see what's actually enabled. And from there, try to generate some of the, the, the code that's actually going to be used uh, that can actually help. But I'm not sure. Uh, again, uh, I'm open to ideas here. Uh, I'm also open to the idea that don't go further this way. Probably it's just a waste of time. And of course, both for this uh, dispatch idea that uh, uh, I look into, as well as like the LTO, we need to ensure that uh, no subtle bugs are being introduce like in on the small boring tests things just worked but yeah on real world that real world projects things may not be as clear cut uh you can think that's working and then it's not <laughs> there's always some corner case and that's it uh now it's time for questions. If someone has any questions, uh, that that's basically it. So, anyone has questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, I'm so time to ask. Thank you so much. Okay, does anyone in the audience have any questions they'd like to ask? I don't think we have any right now. I'm going to do one last virtual check. Still nothing in there. OK. OK. Yeah. Oh. Uh, if someone oh, hold on. We have one. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah, I would just promote the Discord uh, you can use. I think that's no number at the end of Discord anymore. But uh, yeah, you can always try to find me there. Um, do you think it's reasonable to automatically detect how many instances of an API are kind of existing in a given application build? Because as you suggest, there's somewhere 
it will only ever be one, like an SPI driver or whatever. But the sensor subsystem, you might have a dozen sensors. Um, so like, do you just only do the um, static dispatch Python script stuff for ones you know will only have a single one, or do you automatically detect it, or do you have any feeling for that? Yeah, actually, the, the script does detect that, so it's possible. Uh, it's really a good question about the sensor subsystem. It won't actually be really useful in there, but at least for G-Scan, it, it's, actually, it's actually possible. Well, basically, on, on, on my script, uh, what I had is like I tried to have, I went on all the, the directories that I enabled. It had like, uh, then it goes into the CMake uh, files and try to find the Sephir you know, source if it's def. Some cases are different. For those, I kind of had to manually hack that into my script, and then I can have like a list of everything that's enabled. So it's doable. So yeah, we could at least use that to see if there's more than one and when it's actually worth. And I basically did that. I think that for uh, ZMK, I think there's more than one key scan, for instance. So I, I had to disable that. So uh, so that's doable. Uh, and yes, yes, we can use that to get more information about the if it's actually worth doing that, or if the reward parties are actually using more than one, definitely. Just to confirm, is that script running automatically as part of the build process, or is it some pre-step that you run? Uh, and I, I run uh, on part of the build, but it wasn't. Uh, it's kind. Of, it was automatically on the build. Uh, it's just that uh, I didn't uh, integrate it with the build completely. So in my experiment, I basically run once, uh, the, then the key config is generated. Uh, then I run the script to generate the auto-generated code, and then I finish running the build. That's basically how it does. So it starts the build, I hook into some point of the build process, and then I finish running the build. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, I think that that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. And is there any um, way that they can contact you? Are you on Discord or something else if anyone has any additional questions? I oh, it's, it's on part. the screen. Uh, oh. And yeah, yeah, I just said thank you. And there's the Discord here. And yeah, and I think that's also the, I think you can go on the events page and see the, I think there's a, a way to ask questions there. Uh, I'll be looking to that. So if you just see like the um, the app, uh, something I kind of forgot about the provider of the videos, but I, I'm looking to that too. So if someone asks any questions there, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to reply. I think we are good. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.